Happy Thursday, folks. March 4th, 2021. You're watching the Daily Mix TV. Hi, my name is Sean Patrick Hillman. I am so sorry the episode is so late today. Uh, and I'm also sorry for the casual attire. I had to go to the dentist for a few hours this morning to get a few procedures done, which is also why I'm having a little bit of a challenge talking properly. Uh, also, I had to do some deliveries for Rock and Rawhide. As you know, tomorrow we won't have an episode because I'm going to be in Albany all day for meetings. So today's episode is going to be a little longer than usual. Stick around to the very end because I'm going to tease the story that we're going to be working on for next week. Let's get on to the news. Looks like even the Mouse House is not pandemic proof. Disney has announced plans to close 20% of its Disney stores, which translates to about 60 in North America. Now, Disney cited changes in how, when, and where consumers are shopping due to the pandemic. As such, the entertainment giant says it's going to focus solely on e-commerce and better linking its, quote, online shopping experience to its Disney Parks apps and social media platforms. Now, this should come as absolutely no surprise to my fellow journalists, my fellow marketers, given that the IBM U.S. Retail Index has shown that coronavirus basically pumped up that shift from brick and mortar to online shopping on steroids and accelerated that time frame by five years. So, in the interest of fairness, okay, because a real journalist looks at both sides of a story, this begs the question, the Disney story begs this question, are retailers victim of the same laziness and lack of creativity I've been slamming them for for the last decade? Well, the answer is yes and no, okay? Let's be fair. There was a time when department stores were just incredibly creative, very forward-thinking in terms of their product mix, how they reached out to consumers, how they marketed their properties, those kinds of things. A lot of that has changed in the last 25 years and not necessarily for the better. Corporate partners and you know private equity firms, those kinds of things, have really dulled down some of that creativity. And it's not purposeful. It's cost control. At the end of the day, there's a reason why a company like Target can outpace the Saks Fifth Avenue 10 to 1 because they're way more creative and they can shift on a dime. Whereas Saks Fifth Avenue is beholden to Hudson's Bay and they've got a lot of liability and overhead. Whereas Target is a little more flexible in those kinds of things, especially with their collaborations. So that is the answer to yes. The answer to no is you can't really blame retailers for falling off because of a pandemic. That's obviously not their fault. But there are very, very few exceptions to that notion. There are some retailers who did some incredible programming during the pandemic and continue to do it. Then there are those who have relied on the tried and unfortunately not so true anymore methods of targeting consumers. Let's hope that for Disney's sake, and, and I've worked for Disney, so I know they've been a client of mine many times over the years. Um, you look at Disney and how smart they are from a marketing standpoint. I mean, just look at Disney Plus. Look at how incredibly fast that platform has grown. So yeah, of course, they've got the Disney DNA, the Walt Disney you know, Company DNA. So it makes sense. But for Disney parks, for their stores, that kind of thing, I'm going to be interested to see how this shift works out at this time next year. Popular hipster, hipster cinema chain Alamo Drafthouse has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. It's all part of a purchase agreement with previous investor Altamont Capital Partners and new investors Fortress Inter, uh, Investment Group. Now, bear in mind, we talked about Fortress Investment Group and their acquisition or investment, excuse me, into Alamo Draft House when they did it. Now, just like the larger chains, such as AMC and so on, Alamo Draft House has been hammered by the pandemic, and the resulting lack of confidence by consumers to return to movie theaters is hurting them even further. The chain has cultivated a strong following with their combination of hipster oriented art house films, craft beer, cocktails, wonderful gourmet food service. And just honestly, really good customer service overall. And just like the larger chains, 
Alamo Draft House has been hampered by local restrictions, leaving them to rely on special screening events for revenue. So now that, you know, there are certain states that believe the pandemic is over personally, and again, this is just an opinion. I think they're crazy. Uh, you look at the state of New York, Cuomo, I mean, and this is not a political statement. This is just an observation. Every single time there's a bad headline over the last, call it two weeks, Cuomo comes out the next day and lifts some of the restrictions. I mean, it, it's as obvious as could possibly be that the two are tied. So now movie theaters are going to be allowed to have, I believe it's 25% capacity or 100, theater, 100 people per theater, whichever is lower. So that, I believe, starts tomorrow, I think. So it's going to be interesting to see how that works out in a city like New York, where you do have a fairly mixed bag in terms of people who believe in a mask mandate and those who don't. We'll keep an eye on it for you and report back. Now, you all know, because I've talked about this a couple times in the last few weeks, uh, how much I love brand collaborations. Well, this time, it comes in the form of cheese and crackers. Sargento is adding a little bit of a twist to that classic, pairing with the help of Mondelez International's Nabisco unit. The company is combining several of its natural cheeses with Ritz, Triscuit, and Wheat Thins brands to create a new version of the cheese and cracker snack. It's called Balanced Breaks. Quote, We want to provide snackers with even more variety and convenience, and we know that fans of both Sargento and our partnership brands will have their taste buds wowed by these new flavor combinations. For more than 65 years, Sargento has led innovation in the cheese category, and we're excited to add these products alongside existing favorites in our Balanced Breaks product line. And that's Nikki Mamurik, who's the director of marketing for Sargento Foods. It's available in four combinations that consumers can choose from. So you've got Pepper Jack and Colby Jack Natural Cheeses and Ritz Mini Crackers, Gouda and Sharp Natural Cheddar Cheeses, and Triscuit Mini Original Crackers, Monterey Jack and Mild Cheddar Natural Cheeses with Wheat Thins Mini Original Snacks, and then Low Moisture Mozzarella and Fontina Natural Cheeses with Wheat Thins Mini Sun-Dried Tomato and Basil Flavored Snacks. So, almost a little mini pizza. Sargento's Balance Breaks Cheese and Cracker Snacks are available in packages of three single-serve, one-and-a-half-ounce trays that can be found in the refrigeration section of major retailers across the country. Now, collaborations like this make all the sense in the world. This more so than some of the other ones we've talked about earlier this week. I say that because the notion of cheese and crackers, I mean, folks, make no mistake about it, okay? Whether the media is telling you or your friend on Facebook is telling you the country is going to recover in 18 months, they're out of their goddamn minds, okay? There is not a snowball's chance in hell that that is going to happen. Economically, we are in for one hell of a roller coaster ride, and it's going to be a very, very ugly situation very soon because at the end of this month, you have millions of people that are facing eviction because that federal moratorium is over. And we haven't heard anything from the White House yet as to whether that's going to get extended. I don't think it's going to, although that does depend on the $1.9 trillion stimulus package that uh, Senate is voting on. So we'll see what happens on that front. But my point in this is, in times of econo economic uncertainty, again, I'm sorry I'm having so much trouble talking because of the dental work I had done today, but in times of economic uncertainty, people look to comfort items. They look to things from their childhood or their young adult life that make them smile, that make them feel better. So cheese and crackers, believe it or not, is one of those things. It's a comfort food. It's an easy snack. It's something that everybody enjoys. So for Sargento, brilliant strategy. For Mondelez's Nabisco unit, who we've done work for over the years, I think this is brilliant, very fun, very cool. You know, the problem with older snacks, like crackers and those kinds of things, they're viewed by millennials and Gen Z as their mom and dad's snack or their grandparents' snack, and it's not, it's not their snack. This may actually send that, may actually flip that notion. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens on that front. All right. 
The Michaels companies are being acquired. And the deal gives the arts and crafts mecca a $5 billion valuation. Michael said that it has entered into an agreement with private equity firm Apollo Global Management that will take the chain private. Now, bear in mind, about 15 years ago, if memory serves me correctly, Bain Capital and Blackstone acquired Michaels and took the chain private in a deal that was worth more than $6 billion. So during that time, You've had this going on in terms of their revenue and profit margins, in terms of growth and retraction, growth and retraction. So it's interesting to see that their valuation today is a billion dollars less than it was 15 years ago. Now, the company did go public again in 2014. So let's get back into the story and then we'll talk about the summary. So they entered into this agreement. Apollo has agreed to acquire all outstanding shares of Michael's stock at... $22 per share in cash. That is a 47% premium to the closing stock price uh, about, what, a week and a half ago? A week ago on February 26th. Now, that deal has an equity value of $3.3 billion and a transaction value of $5 billion. Michaels currently has more than 1,275 stores in North America and said the terms of the deal were unanimously approved by their board. Quote, Our Michael strategy and the work that we have done in the past year have led to phenomenal business results, strengthened our core business, and positioned Michael's for long-term sustainable growth. As a private company, we will have the financial flexibility to invest in, expand, and improve our retail and digital platforms. And that's Ashley Buchanan, CEO of Michael's. So, excuse me, during this pandemic, shares of Michael's have gone up almost 300% according to a report out of the New York Times. Remember, the retailer has seen a massive surge in sales as Americans were mostly stuck at home during the pandemic and they decided to switch into, whether it was a, a side hustle or arts and crafts, they wanted to you know, start to learn a different, a different craft, that kind of thing. Very smart for them and they certainly benefited from it. Now, the chain's third quarter sales rose 15% uh, in the year to $1.4 billion, while its online sales more than doubled. So let's peel back just one layer of the onion, and then we'll move on to the next story. When I think about Michaels, and I think about, you know, my wife loves Michaels, my mother loves Michaels, it's a great store. It's a great operation. I'm afraid that, and maybe this, this fear is a little paranoid it's possible i'm afraid that when you look at apollo global management how are they going to maintain the brand dna of michaels you know you're talking about a company that has been very specific in what they want out of their investments and their acquisitions when you look at bain capital and you look at uh, blackstone acquiring them back in 2006 Both of those companies are very smart in how they've done their acquisition cycles. You know, Bain Capital has does have a history of uh, pump and dump in terms of and I I don't mean that in the illegal sense. I mean it in a strategic sense. Sorry, I should be more specific. Um, Bain Capital has had a history of pumping up the value of a company. And obviously that's their job. They put money in. They want to pump up the value and then exit and sell. Right. Makes sense. It just seems a little weird that some of their investments over the years have literally flatlined the minute they were sold. So it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to work out. I'm hoping Apollo does the right thing here. And I'm I'm sure knowing how Ashley Buchanan has run this company and knowing what's going on with Michaels and seeing how they have grown over the last year because of the pandemic, and they were very smart in how they pivoted their messaging around it, Uh, It's going to be interesting to see how this works out. I'm hoping Apollo with Ashley have done their job and are looking at really good strategic growth and and certainly things that will help them grow from a consumer-facing standpoint. Dollar Tree reported Q4 sales that missed street estimates and said that they're ramping up its store growth and remodeling. They've got a new push for a new format that combines both of their banners. The discounter plans to open 600 stores and renovate 1,250 family family dollar locations this year, 
with the openings consisting of $400 tree stores and $200 family dollar stores. So the new family dollar stores will be comprised of combination stores and what they call H2 stores. H2 features improved merchandise offerings and includes a Dollar Tree dollar section and more freezer and cooler doors. So it's basically a more robust offering. Now, this was first piloted back in 2019. The combo store format combines Dollar Tree and Family Dollar brands under one roof. It's designed more for small towns and rural communities with populations of about three to 4,000. So those are markets where the company wouldn't be able to necessarily open a standalone Dollar Tree store because there just is not enough revenue and not enough density of population there. Now, compared to other family dollar stores in small markets, the combination stores are delivering about the same store sales lift, uh, maybe greater than 20% on average, which is great. And that comes direct, that quote, or that percentage comes directly from the company. The stores also deliver higher gross margins and are better at leveraging store expenses, primarily because you're talking about a smaller focus. Quote, we are extremely pleased with our customers' response to the new combination store concept. As I've said in the past, we will continue to refine our strategic store formats so that we are better able to serve customers while improving store productivity, margins, and returns. We want formats that leverage the best of the Dollar Tree and Family Dollar brands to serve customers in all types of geographic markets. We believe we can continue to change, evolve, and and improve. And that's Michael Witniski, who is the president and CEO of Family Dollar. You know, Dollar Tree did say that the combination store concept in H2 format will be part of its new store and renovation strategy moving forward. So, all right. <clears throat> For them to do this is very, very, very smart. Because when you look at that segment of retail, it's still very popular, makes all the sense in the world. When you think about small town USA, the three to 4,000 know, population town, being able to bring something like this to their town not only increases local tax base and revenue, it helps local residents because, let's talk about uh, upstate New York as an example, the Hudson Valley. In Columbia County, there's a town. It's got about three or 4,000 people. I think it's closer to 3,000. And they're about to get a Dollar Tree or a, a, one of these combo stores. I raise this point because the people in that town have to drive either 20 minutes north to a grocery store or 20 minutes south or rely on some long haul delivery service that might show up by midnight. Okay. So when you think about that, with the added, you know, uh, the added freezers and uh, refrigeration doors, cooler doors, this allows those small towns to have access to easy, readily available groceries, which they weren't able to do before. So for them, it's very smart. I can't wait to see what the revenue numbers on this look like. Okay. Uh, I got to talk about this very quickly. Last night, someone wrote to us asking what our thoughts were on the recent announcement from Seuss Enterprises that they were eliminating six of Dr. Seuss's books from publishing while there was nary a mention of the legendary and iconic children's author during Read Across America Day, despite the fact that the entire program was based on Dr. Seuss. Now, because I helped to mount the original Seuss Centennial program for Seuss Enterprises, and because we've spoken about politics too much this week on the show, I'm not going to dive into this other than to make one statement. Censorship of any kind, even by a publisher of a deceased author, is not right. Unless that censorship is because it incites violence or it's a true harm to society, all that does is prevent people from learning the lessons the author was trying to teach them. Now, of course, I'm talking specifically to children's books. But when you get into censorship overall, there's a reason why freedom of press and freedom of speech is so sacrosanct in this country. And for, I mean, you know, it's one thing if this were a playbook for the KKK or the neo-Nazi movement. 
of course that should not be out there. But Dr. Friggin' Seuss? I mean, really? All right, moving on. For this week's Throwback Thursday, do you remember this? All right. This is Chet. You remember me, Chet Ripley? How you doing? This is his family. You can run around here naked as a bear and not worry about running into anybody. That's right. Comedy legend John Candy passed away from a heart attack 27 years ago today at the age of 43. He, from Stripes to Uncle Buck to Canadian Bacon and everything in between, the man was utterly brilliant. And I remember the day he passed away vividly. I remember exactly where I was and who I was with. And, you know, John Candy for Gen X kids, okay, you know, those who actually you know, had their primary forming in the 80s, their primary upbringing in the 80s, uh, you know, or the late 70s in the 80s. Uh, John Candy was a force to be reckoned with. We all loved him so dearly. As a matter of fact, it's, it's ironic I'm doing this story. A few moments before you know we went to film, uh, I was actually on Facebook and my old uh, prep school mate, John Swan, I actually saw on his feed, he had talked about the fact that today is, you know, 27 years ago today is when John Candy died. Now, since there's not going to be an episode tomorrow, here's a special Flashback Friday for you. Yeah, comedy icon uh, John Belushi died of a drug overdose, believe it or not, on March 5th in 1982. Back-to-back -back days of remembrance for two very large comedic personalities. You know, I remember the first time I saw Animal House and certainly Blues Brothers and some of... Uh, some of John's earlier work on Saturday Night Live. Sorry, I'm still having problems. On Saturday Night Live. And I actually remember I was only, God, I had to have been, what, six? Six or almost, yeah, I was six years old. I remember seeing the news that, that John had passed away. And years later, when I, I think it was like two years later when I had actually seen Blues Brothers for the first time, I was like, oh my God, I remember when he died. So it's 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 interesting as a child what what you take away from certain news events and things like that. All right, at the top of this broadcast, I had said I was going to tease something that we're going to work on for next week. So here it is. Many of you who know me know that I've been a journalist since I was 19 years old. Okay? I took a number of years off for a whole lot of the right reasons and I sort of started the Daily Mix TV to provide the unadulterated truth to what's going on in the news, in pop culture, and in business from a marketing standpoint. So when I look at a story I saw this morning, which has just got me, actually it's got me pretty angry. Uh, I know I don't seem it because I'm just exhausted from having all this work done in my mouth, so these people should be thankful I'm not screaming. But uh, I was I was reading Forbes online this morning and I saw a story about an automat operation that has launched in New Jersey. Now, on its face, okay, I mean it was a pretty averagely written piece. It wasn't blow away. But I remember the days when Forbes was the gold standard of financial journalism, of business journalism, and more importantly, business lifestyle. So you could always count on a Forbes reporter to do their due diligence and their research. I bring this up because I'm not sure if the reporter who wrote this story, and I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but I'm not sure that the reporter who, who wrote this story actually understands the automat business and what's going on, where it started, why it started, and what's going on today. But for all of you, there's a New Jersey operation that's opened an automat. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, as you can see on your screen, this is a shot from the actual story itself of the New Jersey operation. Here's the thing. It's designed for you to go in, you know, contactless ordering of food uh, and be able to literally get a full meal walking out the door, less expensive, more modern, all that fun stuff. Now, Here's why I say that this, this story is incredibly lacking. There are at least, that I can think of on, off the top of my head, and you guys know I have a lot to do in food, 
I, I can think of off the top of my head four or five other operations that are way more innovative than this was. And as a matter of fact, one of those, and yes, I am going to do the disgraceful promotion that I have to because I love this man. I've known him so long, and he's just a brilliant marketer and a brilliant operator. Stratus Morfogan, who I've, he's been a buddy of mine for a long time, and Christ, I've known him almost 30 years. When I look at what Stratus has done with the Brooklyn Dumpling Shop, which hasn't even opened yet, but it is being called the Tesla of Automat, okay? When I see that he wasn't included in this story, and the writer does cite one or two other operations, I do have to ask the question, was Forbes paid to do this story? So we're going to dive deeper into this next week, but real quick on the Stratus front, I mean, here's another reason why, as a journalist, if I were writing that story, I would have included him. Before even opening his doors, he already has franchise deals on the table to expand Brooklyn Dumpling Shop across the country and, believe it or not, across the world. So, you know, Stratus has got to be one of the most creative, hardworking, brilliant guys in the food business. And for Forbes to not pay attention to that, given the amount of noise that that Stratus has gotten for the Brooklyn Dumpling Shop and how innovative and technologically advanced his automat format is. Stratus spent a lot of time building this. So again, we'll talk about this more next week, but I'm disappointed in Forbes for this one. All right, guys, I'm out of time. Reminder, no, uh, no episode tomorrow because I'll be in Albany for meetings all day, but we will be back on Monday. We hope you guys have a great weekend. My name is Sean Patrick Hillman. If you guys have any questions, comments, or story ideas, please email the Daily Mix TV at gmail.com. We'll see you on Monday.